everyone. Hi and welcome to Terminal 1 and welcome to Ratio. My name is Petko Zelazov uh, and it's, uh, it's really a privilege to see so many people deciding to spend literally the first warm evening in the last few months in a basement, you know, talking about the end of days. Uh, so that says a lot about you as a crowd, by the way. Uh, okay, I, I, I see you know fairly a lot of new faces here, so I don't know how much how many of you are familiar with uh, what we do, but I'm just gonna say that we've been doing science communication for almost ten years now, and this is the first time that we decided to do uh, a show, a topic around climate change. Now, one of the reasons about that is that we usually don't like yelling on stage, and uh, you know people usually don't fight about you know, the Big Bang or evolution. Although, I, I think these are not good examples, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we are way overdue in, in actually exploring this topic for really obvious reasons. I mean, you guys are all uneducated folk, and uh, we all have this uh, you know, existential fear you know, lurking behind somewhere, somewhere here about what is, what is going to happen and how we're going to tackle this, this serious issue. And it's becoming more and more evident that there is really no scientific controversy around what is actually going on. You know, the controversy is around what is it that we should do about it. So, in order to explore the topic, obviously one event will not be enough. So we have dedicated a whole month talking about this issue, talking about saving Earth. Usually in April, we focus on space. Obviously, it was uh, Space Day. How do you call that in English? Yeah, Space Day, a few days back, uh, honoring the first flight of human in space. Uh, we usually do, uh, you know, a space month, uh, but it does make sense when you think of it. I mean, the first space flight, uh, it also gave us a glimpse of Earth from a very different perspective that reminded us of the fragility of Earth. So, uh, April will be our green month. Uh, you can, you know, plug in in different events that we will be doing uh, in the course of the month, listen to all our podcasts. Uh, it promises to be very, very interesting and informative. So today we're going to start with a discussion uh, around climate change. We're going to spend, uh, you know, a few, uh, a, few, a few minutes of the events to explain the basic science of what is actually going on. Uh, what is it that we can expect? As, as an effect of global warming. And a substantial part of our discussion we will span on uh, talking about why is it that we don't care? You know, we all kind of do, but we don't really. Yeah. So exploring this, uh, this, uh, this part of the, uh, of, uh, of, of the, of the issues is, is really probably the most important thing that you know, society should be focusing and how to focus our energies towards, uh, you know, collectively addressing that. Uh, so today in a discussion, uh, thanks to the Laszlo Institute, um, uh, this is the Hungarian Cultural Institute in Sofia, uh, we have invited a couple of uh, very nice people from Hungary. Uh, they're part of the, and let me pronounce that, you're all well aware of, uh, you know, the specificity of, of Hungarian language. This is the Mashfel Fok uh, organization, which means 1.5 degrees. Of course, I don't have to explain this reference. Uh, we have Amanda Sabo. She's a meteorologist, and she has a she has a PhD, and she's been working for the organization for quite a while now. And of course, we have Peter Veit, who is the project manager of the organization. So let's welcome with applause our two guests, Peter, Amanda. Please welcome on stage. Okay. All right, so welcome to Bulgaria. Did you fly in? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that we are going to get this question. Yep. <clears throat> you know, addressing, you know, the, 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 our collective hypocrisy is always useful. Yeah, sure. you know, I was thinking by coming with food, but it would take like a week. Yeah, so. yeah it's not very practical, is it? All right. Uh, let's let's uh, first, you know, get one thing out of the way. You know, I, I, I did cover, uh, I, I did say that, you know, climate change is always at the back of our minds, kind of, but it's, it's never a priority. And obviously, right now, I mean, there's so many things going on. You know, we have a war, horrible war nearby. We have, like, in, inflation, immigration. We have all kinds, of, all kinds of issues. Why do we need climate change to still be our top priority collectively <laughs> as a global society? 
Well, as a project manager, I'm going to answer two questions before answering this one. <laughs> first, first and foremost, I would like to say thank you to all you guys coming here and listening to us, and especially to this topic, because you could do anything else but to listen to this. And the first step of solving the problem is to not turn a blind eye on it. So mm. thank you. I, I would also like to thank Ratio for hosting us, sure. our partner in Bulgaria, Klimateka, and especially uh, the Hungarian Culture Institute for their generous support. So that was the first statement. And, and the second one regarding the war, what we are going to talk about uh, here tonight uh, does not uh, uh, is not in controversy against the war. I mean, we are all devastated what is happening uh, in Ukraine. Uh, it should immediately stop, but uh, but it's going on for almost two months uh, now. And yeah, to be frank, to stop the war is much more important uh, uh, than focusing on climate change. But it's a bit more tricky than that. Can we have uh, the web page? So I, I'm not sure that you can see it, but uh, uh, just think about the numbers. And when I finish the sentence or this part, how much money did EU member states pay for Russian fo uh, fossil fuels for the Russian Federation? Which is, well, uh, it's much more of an ethical question right now because currently we are funding the war against Ukraine. Mm. Svetlana Krakowska, who is a Ukrainian scientist and uh, the member of the IPCC, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, uh, stated in an interview with The Guardian that this is a fossil fuel war. And we should focus on that what kind of energy system Europe has, which does not only fuel climate change by burning fossil fuels, we are, all, we are also fueling regimes like Vladimir Putin's mm. uh, war machine. So when we talk about climate change, of course there are many more issues in the world. And this does not mean that they uh, shouldn't be considered and solved, like poverty, mm. um, uh, education, uh, uh, filling the gender gaps, all of that, mm. or finishing war. But it's a kind reminder that climate change is like above all of these and fueling these conflicts and these problems in the world. Mm. So if we can solve climate change, there's a good chance we will not accelerate all the other problems in the world, from climate migration, from f uh, fossil fuel wars, right. poverty, etc., etc. So yes, even in wartime, I think it's very important to focus on this topic. And that was, I was so grateful that you guys took the time and energy mm. to come here. All right, let's spend some time now on science, right? Now, can you explain to us the very basics of, of climate change? Let's spend a few minutes as a, as a standing ground, you know, before we move on with the discussion. Yeah, so what we can really clearly say that science is crystal clear, that the reason is the same what we have been keep saying in the last few decades uh, because of the emission of uh, greenhouse gases we are uh, creating a global warming and with that we are basically changing the climate mm -hmm. of our uh, planet and um, and uh, because of uh, all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, it's still not stopped and uh, we just go to the next slide which i will try to show uh, so what you can see here is um, how uh, the climate warming projections looks like and you don't have to read uh, the whole graph but uh, what's clearly uh, visible is that the very top with the bluish uh, line shows that uh, was the direction of uh, warming, yeah, thank you so much, was the direction of warming if we uh, follow all the policies which are... Um, which, currently in effect. Yeah, which are currently in effect. And then uh, the green line shows uh, what we should do if uh, we want to keep this uh, 1.5 uh, degree target. So just to explain what this uh, 1.5 means, uh, beside uh, the name of our project, it's uh, also uh, like the limit um, set by the scientific community, uh, which we should uh, really keep uh, the climate, uh, like the global warming below. So right now uh, we have, um, we warmed up our planet with about 
over, now over 1.1 uh, degree, and it might not seem a lot, but you probably all uh, already experienced uh, many effects of climate change because of uh, the heat waves, because of the droughts, or just you saw on TV many uh, extreme events. And, uh, and what science clearly said that if we uh, keep warming our planet and we reach uh, 1.5 degree, after that, uh, beside all these effects, which are we already experiencing, so it's not the question of the future, it's here now. And if we reach uh, this point, um, and we are on the track to reach it pretty soon, after that, many effects on the ecosystems and on, on human societies won't be uh, returnable. So that's why we really have to keep it in mind. And in 2015, with the Paris Agreement, uh, all the nations agreed that they will try to keep global warming uh, well below uh, 2 degrees. And uh, they try to keep this 1.5 degree. However, even though we know that what's the cause of the problem, the emission of greenhouse gases, and what we have to do, stop emitting greenhouse gases, uh, they are still, like, uh, the emissions are still increasing. Mm. Let's, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's address the elephant in the room, right? Uh, ob obviously, there is no question that the planet is warming. I mean, this is e easily observable. Uh, what is controversial, though, in some circles, say, is the cause. So we're saying, okay, uh, we have we have warming of the climate, but is uh, is it, is it really humans that are doing this? Can we explain that in you know through other means? You know, that there there's been talk about you know the effects of the sun, you know, sun flares, about the role of volcanoes, for example. Can we cover some of these? You know, spend some time on those, and if we can debunk them, if they are debunkable or. Yeah, in, in order to answer that, I will show you one of my favorite uh, graphs related to climate change. Yeah, so don't get too scared. You don't have to read this all. And I won't have like a 90 minutes presentation about science, which I would love to do, but I really won't. Mm. Uh, yeah, so what you can see here is basically uh, climate and the changes in climate in the past uh, 66 million years, so quite some time. And uh, what we can see, I will... Um, so uh, we are here now in the end, and uh, what I would like to highlight is the time scale. So here in most of the graphs, you can see like the changes in million years. I mean, I, it's really hard to understand that because it's such a long time. And uh, you can see changes in climate because the climate of the Earth uh, have been changing during the Earth's history. And you can see the different rates of this change. And then in the end, humans claim uh, and as you can see, what happened in millions of years, or then ten thousands of years, we are basically creating the same rate of change uh, just in a few mm. decades. Mm. And uh, related to the cause, uh, of course, there are many, many things which can affect uh, climate. And these are keep affecting it, and that's why you can see that the climate has been changing. And it is caused by the sun, by volcanic um, uh, eruptions. However, uh, in the end, uh, this is caused uh, because of uh, the changes in greenhouse gases. And uh, yeah, all these uh, previous changes uh, had the same reason. However, those have been caused by natural reasons, and the change happened over a long time. And if you just go further, for example, if we talk about the sun, uh, you might heard about uh, how the climate spots, uh, how the spots on the sun uh, appear and disappear, mm. and it has, for example, an 11 um, years uh, uh, cycle. And if you just uh, have a look at the uh, current level of uh, this effect, and uh, this uh, red line is what we have now, and the blue would be if there was like an entire minimum in this effect from the sun. And that would cause like a few tenths of degree if it's in the, at the biggest rate. Just to repeat, this one would be like 0 0.3 degree change if it's like in an extremely rare event. Mm -hmm. And what humans caused is like 1.1 uh, 1 degree. Mm -hmm. So it's much more. And if we just go further. So there is an effect, but it's just minuscule. Of, uh, of, of, of the, there of the there is an effect, uh, but it's um, 
it's involved in this rate what we see now mm -hmm. and it's much smaller than yeah. what we cause okay. in okay. a small. And okay. then uh, another thing what you probably heard about is how uh, the planetary orbital characteristics are changing. I really won't go into details. <laughs> However, what's important to see that uh, these effects happen in like 40,000 years or like 100,000 years. And these effects are going on and these are uh, causing uh, changes like uh, pushing the Earth into Ice Age or taking Earth out of Ice Age. However, we really shouldn't have such a big effect mm. on the climate, but still we do have. And um, yeah, and just uh, another thing like volcanoes, for example, we always hope that uh, volcanoes could explain this whole effect. Well, sadly, uh, it can cause also like a massive change again, like uh, 0 0.3 degree and only for like one or two uh, years or, or maybe a bit more. But what we are doing now with the climate system is changing it for hundreds of uh, years mm -hmm. And, and in a rate what normally would cause uh, with all these effects together in thousands or millions of years. And we just did it in a few decades. So well done, humanity. Yeah. <laughs> we did a lot, but we should really stop. Yeah. And you can, know, I add, can I add something just ahead. to sum it up? So Earth's climate has been changing almost all the time. We should consider ourselves lucky that we have a climate equilibrium in the past 10 or 20,000 years. We should consider ourselves lucky that it's not volcanic activity, solar activity, etc., etc., what you have heard, because we cannot influence that. Mm. If that would be the case, then yes, we are doomed. We should have another drink or something yeah. like that, or migrate to Mars with Elon Musk. But, but since we have created this problem, we have the solutions to solve it. So right, that's, right. that's the... That's the good news, the bad news that we are not solving. I think it's important uh, when I'm looking at this uh, graph, looking at the Paleocene, you know, all these um, uh, geological ages, and I can't, you know, keep thinking that there was plenty of life during this time. And I think that it's it's very important when we speak about climate change, and communication will be a whole different topic that we will start covering in a few minutes. But I think it's important uh, that that we understand that the Earth is going to be fine long term. Life is going to be fine long term. It's us who are fucked, right? We wanted yeah. to make a reference that because you said that we should save Earth or something yes, like that. Yes. Earth is fine without us. So yeah. it would be I mean in the <laughs> long term these changes of the climate are mostly gonna have an effect on our political, economic uh, society, economic society. Like yeah. Everything uh, that we take for granted. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not only the pandas. You know, that's that's the thing. Um all right, so so we have we have we have we, we have pretty much you know concluded that and and the graph is really obvious you know when humans when we when we start the industrial revolution we see this this peak uh let us try to understand what is the current state of affairs then because we've been speaking about climate change and about this upwards trend since al gore which was i was like five years old you know i think no I was the I was 14 and I was still terrified. The inconvenient yeah. truth. Yes, the inconvenient truth. Yeah. 14 um, years or no, 16. Something years. like that. Yeah, I was a teenager. Mid, mid 2000s. Yeah, and I decided that I'm going to save water and just going to wash once a week or something like that. <laughs> it re really got into my mind at that point. But it's it's been a while since we've been talking about about this issue. Uh, what is the current state of affairs? Because you know, thinking back in time, I'm thinking of the 90s as uh, as freaking awesome time you know nobody cared about things um, obviously there were problems even back then and they are probably worse even now you did mention the ipcc report now this is uh is this an annual report that is coming out explain to us what is the ipcc report which is essentially uh, like the most fundamental document that is being issued on, on climate change right yeah what petco mentioned i just explained earlier the un intergovernmental panel on climate change was created in 1988 just think about yeah. it. Hmm. There has been a scientific community working on this problem for more than 30 years. We have the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which has been signed by almost all, all countries in the world, hmm. including Bulgaria and Hungary, that climate change is a serious threat to the planet, to its societies, to its nations, and we should act on it. Yeah. Then maybe we should jump forward to the Paris Agreement mentioned by Amanda in uh, uh, 2015, where uh, almost, again, all countries in the world came together uh, 
saying that we will do everything in our power to keep uh, global warming well below to the two degrees centigrade. Now the problem is that it, these are voluntarily pledges. Mm. They aren't sanctioned in any way. Mm. So I can promise you everything what's going to happen tonight. But if you cannot sanction me, yeah. what's the point? So, so right now we are we are facing a, a threat uh, that uh, the scientific community, uh, even the scientific community, changed its narrative towards it. Mm. And you mentioned IPCC. IPCC has uh, so-called assessment reports in every six to eight years or seven to eight years. And they are like the Bible of climate change, like the, 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 the whole humanity's knowledge of, of climate change. Mm. Just for one part, one uh, report, uh, which was published like uh, a week ago, two weeks yes. ago, uh, the Working Group Free Report and Mitigation uh, it consists of uh, the knowledge of 18,000 scientific articles, just to think about it. Right. So these IPCC has these... Uh, so it's a huge meta-study, essentially, of what we know. Exactly. At, at, at a certain point, yeah. And the shift was in 2018 when IPCC came out with the so-called 1.5 degrees uh, special report. The narrative was extremely different compared to other assessment reports because IPCC clearly stated that we are in danger. This is bad what is happening. Yeah. Previously, they used a much more scientific language to describe, okay, if I pour some more water, maybe yeah. some will go out. And now they're screaming. Yes, yes, yeah. they are. And it's, uh, to be frank, it's quite... Uh, uh, inspiring to mm. see uh, 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 the head of the World Meteorological 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 Organization. Yeah, nobody can say that. WMO. Word. Okay. Yeah, nobody can say that. No yeah. <laughs> so the leader of WMO yeah. or UNEP, that they are using the language, the narrative yeah. of climate activists. This was unimaginable like five years mm. ago, mm. and this is how the scientific community is uh, like responding to the inaction coming from governments. Yeah, yeah. And even though they're screaming, you still, you know, they they get barely mentioned in the news. You know, they speak about The Bachelor of season one, you know, more than, <laughs> rather than on the screaming scientists that we're all going to die, for Christ's sake. Are we going to die? I mean, what does the IPCC say? Can we can we go through these findings? You know, let's let's cover that. Yeah, so uh, in the latest report, uh, this assessment report, uh, so, uh, in this uh, report, there were three parts. Like, the very first one clearly said it once again aloud that we are causing climate change. And as we mentioned already, uh, the good thing uh, behind that, that we all see the effects already, and since we are causing it, we can do uh, against it, and we can, we can mitigate it. And then, uh, there was the second assessment report, which came out like, um, like a month before about uh, how to adapt mm -hmm. to these changes. And, uh, one important message, uh, from that report was that, uh, beside trying or not trying, beside stop emitting greenhouse gases in, in all the sectors to uh, stop uh, warming our planet even more up, it's really important to realize that there are these effects, what we are facing right now, and uh, we have to also focus on adapting to uh, these um, the climate uh, extreme events mm -hmm. and all these things, and uh, we still have the chance to do it. However, it is also highlighted in the report that uh, the, the window, what we still have in time, it's closing very fast. So it's important to keep it in mind mm -hmm. that we still have the chance, but we really have to act now. And then there was this report from last week uh, where uh, it was about uh, stopping the effects later in the future. And there it clearly said that we have to stop uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. However, for example, as I uh, mentioned already uh, in this graph, we can see uh, one more time that all the greenhouse gases have been increasing and actually we, ex we experienced the biggest increase in emissions in the last decade, even though the science was crystal clear uh, during mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. last decade as well. Can I add just one thing? You, you have to understand that uh, it's not black and white. So we always emphasize this 1.5 de degrees threshold 
because according uh, to the consensus in the scientific community, if we can halt emissions and global heating to that point, we can aver avert uh, many critical dangers in the ecosystems and in the climate. But you have to understand that there's a huge difference, even if we reach like two degrees Celsius global heating, compared to three degrees or four degrees compared to two degrees is like, Mad Max would be a dream. Yeah. Huh. So it's not black and white. So uh, you, every effort makes sense. Every effort, every yeah. zero point one degrees matters. Uh, it, still, the number the number one point five seems fairly arbitrary. I mean, how did they came up with that? Just you know, quick brackets. Do we do we know? Uh, yeah, actually. I mean, how uh, do you how do you decide what, what, in in fifty years what will cause catastrophic change and what will cause only like severe events happening? Yeah, of course. When uh, when scientists are uh, trying to uh, and show and explain and measure uh, which event would uh, cause what kind of consequences, uh, yeah, as we mentioned, it's not black and white. So there are different effects in 1.5, mm -hmm. 1.6, mm -hmm. and all these degrees. But uh, actually, for you know, to try to frame the acts related to climate change. Basically, all the stakeholders and politicians needed some kind of number, you know, to yeah, have a target yeah, yeah, yeah. they can go for. But yeah. it's really important to see that uh, if you reach 1.5, it doesn't mean that, okay, then we are all going to die and let's not do anything yeah. about it. It's just uh, really something to to have a target about it. Okay, so what are, what are some of the potential effects that we might observe. Now, you did mention some of the things that we might be witnessing, like like climate migration, etc. Let's just say we've reached 1.6 you know, <laughs> degrees. What is the Earth that we will inhabit then? I mean, what, what, are, what are scientists imagining when they're framing the issue? But what we can really clearly see that uh, all like the entire um, system, what we what we use now and what we learn to live in, uh, it will change. So, for example, uh, when we talk about droughts or changing in precipitation patterns, it doesn't just mean that, okay, maybe we need an umbrella all the time, or maybe the umbrella won't even help us anymore because mm -hmm. it's so heavy rain. But we just have to think about how um, uh, sensitive our agriculture system is. Yeah. Um, uh, if you just uh, think about the forecast, if we see that uh, there is like a, a very, very mild winter and then we have frost events and then a mild weather again and then a frost event and then we just, uh, we can really see that the prices are increasing because certain products we just can't provide anymore. Yeah. And this is just one effect. And uh, also it's a general problem that in Europe we tend to think that uh, these things won't affect us that much because, you know, okay, it's warm, let's turn on the air conditioning. Well, we can think about that with air conditioning, it's even more emissions, so it gets even warmer. But uh, it's also a problem that um, climate change has the strongest effects uh, on those areas of the world, uh, which are basically our bread buckets. So yep. we just get the food and all the products from those parts where the most people live and they are usually the poorest and they usually have uh, the smallest uh, relation with uh, all these emissions. Yeah. Just that the upper class understands it's bye-bye coffee, chocolate, avocado and all of that. But to make it a bit more serious, uh, if you want to see some visuals, the IPCC created an atlas on how the world would look uh, in different scenarios. And they have it uh, for different regions in Europe, and I'm pretty sure there is one for Bulgaria. Well. Yeah, yeah. So go for it, just Google it, IPCC Atlas, and you will have it all there. It's interesting that you mentioned the sensitivity of the agricultural system, because I now recall that um, one of the major reasons for seeing the Arab Spring, for example, you know, except you know the local events in Tunisia, et cetera, all this, all this fairly new history, uh, that people tend to quickly forget uh, was um, was actually um, you know catalyzed by uh, an increase of a third of food prices in in the in the region, and this caused a whole social revolution across northern Africa and the Middle East. Now we can imagine there is even talk now about the upcoming food shortage because of Ukraine and Russia, uh, and where the effects that we are expecting are like three times worse for these same regions. So. 
you know, speaking about climate change, you know, a, a, a substantial effect on the agricultural system of these areas is literally causing billions of people and, you know, to strive and probably to start moving north, you know? So, so it's, it's, it sounds terrifying. You know? Not because they're going to come here, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's just, it's just from a purely human perspective. I didn't want it to come out this way, you know? <laughs> you know, there, there are other aspects of my liberal hypocrisy that you're going to witness. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, okay. So, so it's it's mainly the effects on our political, economic, uh, economic systems, and uh, and etc. That we need to keep in mind. You know, not necessarily think about pandas all the time. You know, yes, because exactly. you know, they're cute, but we tend to forget about them. You know, what we need to not forget about it is that, that, that our civilization is fragile. So we have to keep that in mind. Okay, uh, so is there anything else about the IPCC report that you feel is, is necessary for us to, to know? I think the most necessary and urgent message of the new uh, free IPCC reports, which will be combined into mm -hmm. a synthesis, yeah. synthesis uh, in the end of the year, just before the, the next uh, uh, climate uh, uh, event, the COP, yep. uh, in November, I think, yep. uh, is that we still have a chance of ach to achieve these goals, but we have to act <coughs> now. And it's, I know it's like uh, crying out wolf, mm -hmm. that the scientists are crying out wolf at least like six years from yep. now. But they are right. So every day, every year we waste on arguing uh, about it. Is this r still real? Are we, mm -hmm. we causing it? Mm -hmm. We have all the solutions. And maybe we are going to discuss economics, but... It's it's not even expensive. I mean, we are already spending a lot of money on uh, mitigating catastrophes because of uh, extreme yeah. weather events, because uh, in crop failure, yeah. because of climate migration, because of upcoming pandemics, not just COVID. We have the reports from another UN body that if we accelerate uh, the climate and eco ecological crisis, there will be... Uh, Pandemics like the COVID, not in every hundred years, but five to ten years. Woo! Perfect. Yeah. Do we want that? And I think the answer is yeah. no. I'm fairly terrified by the like viruses and things that are lurking in the perm permafrost in and, and, and Siberia. You know, for example, it's things like that that really give me the creeps. Yeah. So, yeah. <sighs> Okay. Yeah. I have children. You know, it's difficult for me to think about that. You know, I, 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 it's, it's one of the, I guess it's one of the reasons why people can't feel but, uh, but, but try to be optimistic about that or, or put it at, you know, somewhere, somewhere at the back of their minds because it's, it's genuinely terrifying when you start thinking about that. Yeah. And like youth, mm. like they are terrified. So yeah. that's also one thing which is, um, a newer part of uh, these reports that there are more and more evidence that, uh, people are really scared of these events yeah. and 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 it's a uh, not a new kind of like it's one uh, line of of the depression and the mental problems related to younger people mm -hmm. because they see they already learn about uh, these effects at school but they really feel that they can't do anything right now because they are in high school what mm -hmm. could they do like they recycle and everything but but uh, they can't really do anything else and this fear of the future is just one effect on our health it's uh, it's also a problem that we will see more and more of these events for example the extreme droughts and and uh, heavy precipitation events and and we tend to think that our gdp protects us somehow and mm. we measure everything in gdp but if you just think about uh, the events over uh, last july in for example uh, western germany or belgium like entire houses were were just flooded and entire villages entire villages mm -hmm. went yeah. to the ground and and from these events uh, we won't be able to do anything about it and it is terrifying but what's really amazing that with current technologies and and with with the financial background we already have we could still adapt to most of these effects and that's why it's important to mm. to have these target numbers because then we can see that okay we still can act on it and it's mm. it's really not too late and uh, yeah as we mentioned already we are really trying to protect ourselves and our societies and and we think about that okay it's too expensive to act at least 
nowadays we can still dedicate a number uh, towards how to adapt to climate change and how to mitigate it. Yeah. But if there will be effects we can't uh, reverse anymore, then mm. you won't be able to uh, put a price tag on it because... Yeah, and it's it's going to be immense. I mean, I, I recently read an interview with the uh, with the with the scientist who pointed out a very uh, you know very interesting thing regarding uh, you know the amount of money that eventually we will have to spend if we don't you know deal 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 with things right now. And he gave just one simple example that blew my mind. He was talking about like basic infrastructure that we have, like railroads, bridges, and all of these stuff. And you know they have metal. In them, you know, especially railroads, you know, or, or the concrete, you know, and every shift in the average temperature actually affect, you know, the physical properties of these bridges, of these railroads, of these you know, things, and so, 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 uh, an increase of like of a certain percentage, you know, starts twisting the metal everywhere. And this is insane, you know, when you come to think of it, you know, like buildings literally will stop, like, will start twisting, you know, like railroads, highways. You now the, the cost will be immense, you know, just to trying to fix that as it happens, you know, as it, as it's happening. So I think it's examples like that that are, that, that could be, could be useful, you know, because, you know, getting it to the specifics, I think sometimes helps. And, and I think it's important that we here move to, to communication. Let us try to understand now why is it that besides all the evidence, all the screaming from the scientists that none of us ever hears anywhere, you know, they're screaming somewhere from, from, from far away, why is it that we are yeah. not really acting? And let us first define we. We're speaking about global governments, right? Like as, you know, as a manifestation of our collective will. Why are we not acting? There isn't enough like political will because there is not enough pressure from society? I mean, what is what is happening? Who wants to go? Okay, uh, well, I think it's uh, really a complex problem and it's good that we can mm. go around it a bit. Uh, so, um, as, as we talked about it already, uh, well, first of all, I mean, from a scientific point of view, I, I really get it when people, for people, it's hard to believe that we could change the entire climate system, but that we've really managed to do. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, uh, and it's really, uh, amazing that we did that. I mean, it was a big, big step. It's amazing. It's so cool. <laughs> I mean, not, not in a positive <laughs> way, but like we really had to do a lot mm. to, to change the entire system. So first of all, maybe this, uh, just to understand it, it's the same like, uh, in the don't look up, like to really believe that like a giant, uh, asteroid is, will hit the planet. It's just people said, told that, okay, maybe it will go in another direction. So now we know that climate change won't go into other different direction. Uh, and it's also, really hard because as uh, as the climate change will change everything what we how we live like all the social structures and everything we got used to uh in order to mitigate it we really have to change a lot again and mm -hmm. of course it costs money and then uh as we we mentioned already it's like uh the people who are causing it they are not necessarily those who will be affected by mm. it the most and um so are you are you are you saying that one of the one of the problems here is that that there is too much work to be done that we don't want to do so if we if we say that there is a person who is obviously unhealthy and you go to him and you say you're going to die if you don't diet do sports change your whole life and they start to get into, you know, a denial mode. It's like, fuck that. You know, I don't have time for that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm busy dying. I don't yes, have time I'm busy, for that. I'm busy dying. So, so how do we, how do we, how do we frame this then? You know, how do actually, uh, just to wind back uh, a bit mm -hmm. and then I will answer your question. This thing shows that, uh, this is a paradox because, uh, on a scale uh, of the earth, like the time scale, we saw in the previous picture uh, regarding ice house, warm house effects and all of that, that we have a massively rapid climate change going on right now. Mm. I mean, we had climate change back then, but it was measured in tens of thousands of years or millions of years. Now, we did this in 200 years. Just imagine. And what is very short in Earth scale 
it's too much for us because we're talking about the end of the century. We should curve emissions uh, in the middle of the century to stabilize the climate in the end of the century. Who cares? It's 2022. I mean, I'm not going to be around. So this is like a paradox that we have to solve, that we have yeah. one hand, a very rapid uh, transformation of the climate, mm. and we are we are slow to that, yeah. to adapt. And the second one is that... Uh, is that this is fine? I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're sitting here. This is a very nice place. Yeah. Sofia is a cool town. Never been here yeah. before. I met some cool friends. I mean, why should we worry? I mean, EU funds are flowing in. We have a bright future ahead. Now the thing is that. Uh, uh, I like I, I like how the EU funds is sort of like one <laughs> it's of the an Eastern European one, stuff. one of the good things about life, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> EU one funds. of the few things. So, yeah. But uh, the thing is that from many aspects, even from a global point of view, you can see that there are some good things happening uh, around the world yeah. regarding poverty, education. Seriously, I'm not. This is not uh, uh, ironic or cynical. Yeah. There are some good things happening in the world. Now the thing is that uh, the economy that we have built, what we are functioning, has so many externalities uh, towards climate and environment that it's unsustainable. Mm. But how could we recognize that if our lives keep improving and we don't see, I, I don't know, the the dust or the yeah. or the, or the waste of our civilization because mm. we can put it in landfill, literally. So this uh, this is one of the main problems. So you're saying that we 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 are too comfortable. I mean, the people who can actually change that are you know the well developed industrial societies, right? Because when it when it comes to emitters, you know that's 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 where most of it actually comes from. And in these societies, the paradox is that people live too comfortably to feel you know these effects. They're not in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, or in Baghdad, where the heat is getting, you know, these places will literally be uninhabitable in 20 years, probably. You touched one of the key conflict points in the international climate policy, like the argument who's responsible and yeah. who should pay. Because currently, uh, apart from the United States, uh, China, India, and most developing countries are emitting a lot. And they yeah. say, hey guys, we just want to live like you. You went all through this fossil fuel road, you built your basic infrastructure, your wealth, why we aren't allowed. But now that we, because we know that we have this problem, you created it. Mm. We just want to live like you guys. I mean, in Hungary, we always want to live like the Austrians, and we don't. <laughs> I don't know what about uh, Bulgaria. And why? <laughs> With your car. The Austrians are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, no, if, sorry if there are any Austrians yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't mean that. And just to, just to answer your uh, two previous questions, the, the change, that it's very hard to understand that we have to change everything. And if you go to a person like, yeah, you're dying, you, ch you should change everything in your life. I'm busy dying, sorry, I don't have time yeah, for that. Yeah. It's the same for societies. I mean, you have this cartoon, I think everybody can uh, affiliate with it, that who wants, everybody wants, everybody is in for climate mitigation here, yes. Who wants to change? Who wants to start like changing their behavior? Like how do they vote they, they, their basic uh, principles? there would be a big silence and yeah. okay who wants to step up here and start and i have another venue going on somewhere else yeah, yeah. so this is the same also in international climate policy that uh, for example that the paris agreement could happen uh, that it happened was thanks to because there was a, a leader in the us who was pro climate obama the eu has been pro climate for many long years and they managed to strike a deal with china this is how it was created and it was very, very crucial. But this can be torn apart in like seconds. For example, that who should pay? Mm -hmm. And this is the main conflict in international climate policy that developing countries are, okay, we will stop if you pay for us to stop. And developed countries say that if you stop, we'll play, pay. Yeah. And this is like, we are no, moving nowhere. It seems unfixable you now to a... To a certain, to a Someone certain should start. I mean, this uh, we 
the European Union already reached into its pockets, but not so deep, in a deep enough. And you, we have to understand that this is not just charity. Mm. I mean, we, by funding mitigation, we are saving ourselves. And I can come up with the, uh, those messages spread by the Commission and uh, all the green startups. But it's kind of true that this is also good business, what we have stated in the radio uh, in the afternoon, that if you... If you tend to follow trends that are unfolding in the economy, like green economy, you can you can be rich. I mean, sure. it, it's, yeah. it's not a bad thing yeah. to make the world a better place and have a better life. It's not just ethics. You can have you can build a good business on it. Sure. Sure. And just yeah. to say something what's not entirely depressing about how <laughs> it's really hard yeah. <laughs> to fix it, uh, it's all also clearly, uh, um, so we can also uh, see from all the reports and all the measurements related to economy and, and the scientific part and everything, that it's really not worth it not to go for green anymore and it's really good because the investors if they are clever they will go for a sustainable future and and even though uh, all the mitigation steps and adaptation steps over the last few years since uh, the paris agreement were far too slow uh, in comparison what should we reach still uh, there is a lot uh, what we already um reached finally. So for example, the renewable energy is much more cheaper and, yeah. uh, and much more available. And this is important because we can see the progress and it's a very good path. And just the fact that we are sitting in a bar and you are here uh, listening to us and, and just the fact that a scientist was in a radio, like that would have never happened a few <laughs> years ago. Like no one really cared about yeah. what we want to say. So it's a really, really good direction. But what's important that we have to accelerate it sure you know what pisses me off is like when when the, the the whole way this conversation is is phrased is usually it's like how we should change you know how we should change our behavior and when people sp speak about we, we we recognize you know me you know for example you know when i when i think of it it's like okay i should change but as you pointed out you know asking me to change my whole way of life is terrible you know because i'm busy i have two kids you know i have you know and i guess, I guess oh, my, my point is here i love yogurt right i can i eat like a kilogram of yogurt a day wow and wow. the only way no just, just no of course not but i'm just saying that i love yogurt right so it's like I, I eat like a packet a day or a couple of those and what drives me nuts is that i bear the responsibility of like recycling this, like washing it up, you know, and all of that and feeling freaking guilty every time I buy yogurt because this is the only way to buy yogurt in a plastic thing, you know. And if I eat three of those, you know, I feel like a terrible person. Why is the burden on me? Why should I be recycling? You know, like this is, I, I, and I think this is one of the main questions that should be addressed. You cannot ask people who are busy with their crazy lives anyways, <laughs> you know, to change their lives completely. I mean, this should be shifted, you know, to corporate responsibility. You know, find a freaking way to replace this plastic and let me eat my yogurt. You know, <laughs> I don't have time to wash like 50 of those a week. You, you know what I mean? So... When speaking about communication, you know, and framing framing the topic, do you think that such a change is is important? I mean, am I, am I making a good point here? I mean, yes, I've... yes, you are. You touched mm. uh, on a very uh, very important point, which is uh, what is the connection, the difference, and the symbiosis of individual action and yeah. systematic change? Yeah. So, f for example, companies and governments love to put the pressure on you. Yeah. Like, my favorite is Coca-Cola. Yeah. I'm not a waste. Recycle me. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you paying for our uh, recycling system and the waste management? Is Coca-Cola paying for it? No. Of yeah. course not. They have some taxes, of course. But uh, the price does not reflect the effort, sure. the effort of recycling. And if we would have started from uh, individual actions, like uh, imagine Petco back in the past 30 years ago, washing yogurt, yogurt uh, 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 like a mad mad dog. And uh, I was three years old. But <laughs> but you can, you can. Six. <laughs> Sorry. 
we would have solved uh, most of the climate crisis. But yeah. the thing is that we didn't do that. And now it's almost impossible to solve uh, the climate crisis only with individual action. Sure. Yeah. But we cannot achieve systematic change <clears throat> without individual action and focusing uh, the attention mm. of politicians, decision makers, uh, company leaders that is important for us, that you should help me to live a sustainable life. That's right, yeah. Create yeah. a framework, legal framework, an economic framework. Uh, I don't know, just come up with something. Make it easier for me. Yeah. Let's share yeah. the pressure. And just to imagine, of course, uh, you can quit yogurt. Of course, your life would be terrible after that. But sure. you can do that <laughs> yeah. for your kids. Just yeah. imagine. Yeah. But you cannot uh, make a decision of, okay, how are we going to have electricity here? Yeah. By burning, I don't know, coal, oil, or gas. Yeah. That that decision is not uh, not up to us to make. Mm. It's up to politicians to make, and we have to emphasize to them. We have to vote for politicians who are who have this on the agenda and mm. to have this on their agenda we have to make this an important agenda in our own life yeah. because they are only focusing on on topics that they can measure and uh, what the what an important line was uh, uh, from the movie uh, also uh, produced by Leonardo DiCaprio uh, after the flood yeah. mm. is that uh, our before the flood and this, Freud, Freud is here. Yeah, so. there is flood all the time <laughs> yeah. somewhere. So, so, so uh, before the flood uh, is that our elected leaders are essentially our elected followers. Mm. So if we decide to go to another way, they will follow us. Mm. And what George Monbiot phrased it in a not so polite way that uh, we are we have soci we have societies of the most people most peaceful people and good willing people led by psychopaths. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And and I really don't think that uh, individual act doesn't count. And and the reason why we can clearly see it without uh, being uh, I don't know knowing much about uh, economy or whatever because for example I do not know much but as just uh, a consumer I can see that being green and going for a more sustainable future is becoming more sexy and how can you see that clearly uh, because of more and more advertisement uh, involving greenwashing like yeah. trying to convince you that something is uh, for the green future and if it wasn't a big goal so if people uh, wouldn't go for uh, for uh, these green solutions then they they wouldn't advertise it yeah. so that's i mean it's our job partly to try to avoid greenwashing but it's a good sign Sure, yeah. Still, I'm thinking that, you know, changing your life in a certain direction is usually a privilege that a person has. You know, it's like I can fairly easily change. You know, I can buy a hybrid car because of all the donations from our supporters. Not even close. <laughs> I wish. Uh, but I mean that, like, like most of the people don't really have a choice, you know, to, to, stop consuming something or stop burning fossil fuels. So this is another, probably a counterintuitive point that uh, people often get wrong, I think, uh, is that um, wealth or, you know, the more people are better off, the more they emit. But that's true. Yes, that is that is true. But we, are big, we are all big amateurs here. That is true. Yes. But thinking about the environment, is a privilege of the wealthy, yes. you know. So, so tackling poverty is actually one of the ways to to change, you know, the the the, the collective mind that can actually affect political change, you know. Because let's let's <laughs> let's, what is that? The skills of our enemies. We didn't it? come up with this one. <laughs> so this is yeah, they do that all the time. They're annoying. Thanks for interrupting my awesome point. By the way, uh, I, I I forgot what it was, uh, but. Yeah, I guess we are more responsibility, but it's the same as stated in the UNFCCC, yeah. differentiated responsibilities. Yeah. And you can mirror that to societies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also to countries. But that doesn't mean that we are not involved, that sure. because everybody's involved. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah.
I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm thinking because we're speaking about communication, about uh, like the public discourse around around climate change, and it's like a poor person. You know, he watches TV and he's like, I don't care. You know, I'm hungry. Like 50% of the people in Bulgaria probably don't care about that at all, because they're you know you can you can probably see the correlation and it's uh, it's it's easy to observe. You know, the more well off you are, the more you care about the environment. So tackling poverty is actually one of the ways to deal with that. It's counterintuitive, but you know it needs to be pointed out. Obviously, what is the role of the media here? Um, I guess what I'm saying is that we uh, we obviously live in a world which is absolutely mental when it comes to information. Uh, we are obviously totally incapable of dealing with that amount of information that that we have to deal with, uh, and it it has its effects. We saw that during COVID. COVID. So, um, I mean, what is the problem with media? What what should the media do? What do you think? Well, the media is our greatest ally and uh, our greatest challenge because uh, in our project and in the project uh, uh, of Klimateka here in Bulgaria, we do our best and put in a lot of effort to communicate with the media and to spread all the scientifically approved and reliable messages to you people. So you will have first-hand solid information that what are the risks and what are the solutions that we can turn to. Mm -hmm. Now in the past, the media uh, was kind of uh, in this 50-50 uh, scenario that, uh, okay, we are going to have like a pro-climate action article, but just to be just, mm -hmm. We are going to have like a climate skeptical article. Yeah. Now, if, my favorite. If, yeah. <laughs> if we stick to science, then it would be like we have one climate skeptical article and 99 uh, yeah. climate proactive article. But this is not how the media works. And uh, maybe you you come. It's a false equality, right? The false that equality. They, that they Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah. You should put it on a shirt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sounds uh, like a good idea. And, and yeah. also it's with memes and all the climate science deniers. Of course, now we don't have deniers because <laughs> we have so much data, so much uh, reliable information that if you deny climate change, you're an idiot. Like, uh, <laughs> seriously, you are. Uh, now, so it's fringe now. Uh, is that what you're saying? It's like it's like it's like flat earthers, you know. It's like yeah, they can take an over. They're on the fringes. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. that's a relief, okay. I think. What you have to create is doubt. And this is about what you talked about in the myths, that because it's a very hard change and you come up with information that is not polite, it's not fun, mm. it's not happy, there are no unicorns in the background. If you can grasp into uh, just the smallest uh, skepticism, oh, it's not us, it's the volcanoes, thank you. I can have my yogurt. Yeah, yeah. I can have my yogurt. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's really hard to explain. Like, even now, when I was trying to sum up for you, like, how the climate changed just over the past, like, 66 million years, you know, it yeah. was, I really had to sum it up because I didn't want you to fall asleep or go home or something. Yeah. So that's, that's how it works. But, like, uh, without the explanation, then, you yeah. know, you can question it. And it's really hard because, you know, to deny it, it's really easy. It's like one shiny sentence, like, it's the sun. Yeah. And, oh, no one thought about that before. Well, like, they did. It's yeah. kind of written in those thousands of uh, pages of the IPCC, which is summing up all the other thousands of uh, yeah. publications related to the topic. But no one really cares about it. So just the fact that a scientist is sitting here and for 90 minutes people are listening, that's very unusual. So yeah, but that audience is pretty unusual. I mean, they can sit here for 90 minutes and listen about equations. It's They've seen stuff, you know, on yeah. our events. Like that I can barely handle from the stage. Like, ah, and people are like, ah, you know, it's just weird. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's really really hard to to explain it all yeah. and go go into details. And then of course the questions are there, but most of the people like they have the questions, but they just don't have the time sure, to get yeah. the answers. You sure, know. Sure. And I have a metaphor. What I just uh, said about uh, individual action and systematic change. That it's the same with the media. I mean, if we don't demand. Uh, quality material from the media, they are going to throw trash at us because we demand trash. Then we are going to have going to have hysteria or sensation, dramatic, whatever. For example, when in 2018, the so-called 1.5 degree special report came out, it was very much highlighted in the Hungarian media, which was a good thing. 
But on the other hand, the article say that we have 12 years and we are all going to die. Yeah. And that's not true. Not, that's not what the, the special report, sta report stated. Yeah. This wasn't a quality report of the IPCC's uh, assessment. So it's like we have to have to have a good connection with the media, educate them on how to how to have like um, how to uh, translate these very complex messages sure. to people who don't have the time or the effort mm -hmm. or, or the knowledge to deal with it. Yeah. Like they give you five minutes of of their lives yeah. just to read an article, and you have to do your best, mm -hmm. and it's very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, it bugs me that, uh, you know, you elect people to think for you. Huh? <laughs> it's a good one. I look much better, by the way, when I'm... Yeah, that guy's fat. Uh, no, it's nice to have when your colleagues troll you. So sure, they, they always do that. Uh, all right. All um, right. Guys, uh, we will move to the uh, sort of the question and answer bit okay. right now because we have quite a lot of questions coming in. So um, obviously, guys, not a lot of science here, but I'm, I, I, I trust that it's a very interesting discussion about climate change. What was that? That was my wallet. Apologize. Very professional today. Yeah. So... Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions uh, about what is it that we can do, what are the solutions, is there a technological solution, is there a political one, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, during, as I said, in April, we're going to spend a lot of time discussing all these uh, topics and podcasts and in events. So there is an event coming, by, uh, com coming uh, on, come on, help me out, guys. Show me, show me the graph. 20, what was it? 28th of April. Yes. Uh, that's in, in, in Keba Club. It's called Parnikov Defect. That's not for you to understand. No, it's 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 called like like a. How do you translate that? What is the matter with me? Okay, so uh, at seven o'clock, uh, we will be specifically focusing on the type of things that have to be done uh, to actually tackle tackle climate change. So I'm saying that first of all, so you have information and come and visit us. It's going to be very cool. Uh, and second of all, to focus your questions in a different direction because we're going to have we're going to spend a lot of time on that as well. So these are some of the things uh, that are going to be happening during our eco month. Most of them are like podcasts and videos uh, that you can find on our website and following our Facebook page. All right, now going going to the questions. Um, what do we do with Orban? First of all, I can't believe that there is a question oh. there. But how do we get rid of that guy? No, I'm kidding. Let's not <laughs> let's not touch that. Okay. <laughs> I like Orban. I, 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 I like it because. Like the organizers told me not to collapse on stage, <laughs> so please. Yeah, so, sorry about that. I, I, I just like how it's phrased, like like we're better than you guys. It's like when are you gonna get rid of Orban like we did with Borisov? You know that was. That, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, let's ignore that. Yeah, I I'm mean, a, really. I'm afraid we don't have the mandate to answer that <clears throat> question. Sure. Yeah, please don't. Um, okay. Solutions. <laughs> let's talk about them. Uh, let's talk about that. Now, we are very tempted to think, first of all, that billionaires are going to save us. You know, obviously, we're all expecting Elon Musk to solve you know, climate change. Uh, and second of all, it's related to the first one, that we are always looking for a technological solution of, of a technological problem. Uh, now... Is it too far-fetched to think that there actually is a technical solution to this uh, to this problem that we don't really have to fundamentally change lots of the things that we do, except you know the obvious things, you know, changing the power grid like solar panels, but don't touch my yogurt. You know that's the point. <laughs> is there a technological solution that that we can that we can apply? Uh, so when we talk about a technological solution like uh, those which are uh, really related to like uh, captioning uh, CO2 from the atmosphere with some machine and whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So these are really just uh, pilot models mm -hmm. and, and these are uh, the matter of the future. We will need uh, all these solutions, but uh, with all these things, uh, we really need all the experiments before because as uh, it was a problem to, you know, really quickly put all the emissions uh, like into the atmosphere, uh, we really have to be careful with uh, uh, applying all these uh, technological solutions. But uh, we already do have um, many options. For example, if we just think about what we have already, nature. 
uh, like one of the highlights of the of uh, uh, the IPCC report we mentioned is that just with letting nature coming back to our life, uh, it would help a lot. And uh, when I talk about it, uh, I mean not only like going on trips and try to stay mentally healthy in this crazy world, but uh, if you think about a very, very um, hot day, where would you go? Either to a square full with concrete, and which is really extremely hot, or you would go next to a lake, uh, sit under a tree and obviously you would choose the tree and even for um, like uh, trying to remove CO2 from the atmosphere like uh, of course nature is doing that constantly but uh, the problem is that we are faster than nature sure. yeah. and um, with um, uh, with uh, lowering our emissions that of course um, an important solution, but uh, beside that, nature is doing their job. So with, uh, with uh, having uh, healthy ecosystems, uh, this will accelerate the process as well. Yeah. So when we talk about technology, it's really about these easy solutions. And also uh, related to our daily life, it's uh, an important goal of those people who uh, have money, for example, for fossil fuel, to really uh, pretend that changing our life means that climbing back to the tree, not have your yogurt anymore, <laughs> really not be able to travel anymore, just sit at home in a dark room and try not to die. It's not about that. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the latest IPCC report, uh, for example, related to our diet, what we would need is simply follow something what's healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. and what's uh, recognized healthy uh, in a certain country. And yes, usually it means a bit less meat, uh, much more vegetable and fruit. And I think that's something we could do. And you know, uh, with that, you could mitigate climate change and, and not die too early and enjoy that you mitigated climate change. <laughs> so that's something really cool. Or, or when we talk about changing our city, uh, it doesn't mean that we have to like remove all the buildings and just uh, build new uh, spaceship like uh, very good um, ecological buildings. It really means that if you can, just walk a bit more. Yeah. Or just use your bike and just try to get rid of your car as often as possible. And I think these are really small steps. But if we really all do it, these have a huge effect. Yeah, it's a cumulative effect. On emissions, the, yeah. yeah. Can I add something on the technological question? By the way, great guys, keep the questions coming except for Orban. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, the IPCC report states that uh, technological solutions yet to be discovered even are necessary uh, for the for the solution like we need carbon capture and storage yeah we need technical solutions <clears throat> but it's not a silver bullet that's going to solve all our problems mm -hmm. and the problem is that uh, what you have mentioned with Elon Musk that some topics are very sexy and they can draw attention and not just attention but funds away from solutions that are at hand here yeah. i mean it's we should invest on, on, on extraterrestrial travel, like mm. let's move to Mars. It's, it's insane. I mean, yeah. I would love yeah. to go to Mars. But, but there is, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's literally what's going to happen to Earth, you know? <laughs> so why yeah, would you want to go The there? thing is, yeah. it's much more sexier to talk about mig mi to, to migrate to Mars than yeah. just renovate your buildings so you consume less energy. Yeah. And yeah, but it's so prosaic. These are, you know? these are the solutions that mm. we have at hand. And uh, technology is very sexy to talk about, to yeah. invest in. And the, uh, the basic uh, solutions that we have, like, for example, changing our way of eating, mobility, buildings, infrastructure, all of that. Yeah, all the solutions simple. that we have are just so lame, seems lame although they have a much more uh, bigger impact than we should discover, like, uh, cold fusion. Sure. Where? When? I mean, we have Well, fairly recently, by the way, we are covering <laughs> that in our podcast. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, uh, we're getting there. So we're it's, getting there, okay. it's, it's a pretty cool technology. I, I respect that. But speaking of, like, like all technologies get, that can actually help us in conventional... I'm sorry for doing this. I apologize. Like That's I'm, fine. I'm waving my hand. Gonna, yeah. Uh, one of the low-hanging fruits that are fairly obvious but are very controversial, um, especially here in, 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 in Europe, in most countries, not in all, is nuclear power. Is nuclear power, you know, I, I know it's a difference of opinion. You know, General, I'm just asking for your opinion because there is no consensus there scientifically. Um, 
isn't it like the quickest solution of our energy crisis and and and, and transition? So the thing is that, uh, just to give you a small insight, that uh, uh, we have this climate science news network uh, with uh, Klimatek, our Bulgarian friends, yep. and also some friends from Serbia and Romania. So we try to make this regionally hap uh, happen, and uh, uh, our Romanian colleague always says that it's easy for you, you're a nuclear superpower, Hungary. Yeah. And, the, <laughs> and, the, and the thing is that uh, when it comes to nuclear energy, I would quote the International Energy Agency, which uh, in its new scenario, not just abandoned uh, fossil fuels at all, which was a huge leap towards. If you look at reports from the uh, IEA back 10 years ago, this could have been unimaginable yeah. that uh, what they took. The thing is that, of course, you might need uh, nuclear energy uh, in, the glo in, in the global scale. Yeah. But would you invest in it? Because it's extremely expensive, it's not flexible, and maybe there will be new technologies like in five years, 10 years, yeah. which will be much more cheaper. And if you invest in a nuclear power plant, you need at least, I don't know, three decades, five decades to have some in, uh, return of your yeah. investment. So it's basically, yeah, we can say that uh, nuclear energy is um, uh, has zero emissions, which is not all that true, and we can talk about the, the disasters uh, that can come from uh, any tragedy with uh, nuclear power plants. Sure. We saw that. Uh, if you destroy a solar panel, you, you don't wipe out uh, half a continent. So yeah. You should think about it, but the economic side, it's not worth it. Because renewable energy is much more cheaper. Of course, you have to make the grid uh, much more advanced to, ex yep. uh, to uh, adapt to this uh, flexible uh, system, but it's still cheaper than building nuclear power plants all around the world. Yet, in some places, it could be necessary, but in Europe, I think it's not. And uh, I know that you're maybe you're anxious about knowing that in Hungary, the current government is very much pro-nuclear. Uh, and I think that it's going to be a stranded asset. If they decide to uh, uh, build another uh, reactor besides the one we already have, it's going to be stranded. It's a bad investment. Mm. And, and what we also have to see that uh, often when we think about, uh, for example, nuclear energy, it's it's uh, what we do, of course, often. Yeah, so it's it's a huge amount of energy, and that's why people like it, because then you have it uh, yeah. just right there. But uh, it's also an issue that we just uh, consume a lot of energy, what we wouldn't even need if, uh, for example, our uh, building would be fairly isolated, or we wouldn't consume uh, like really uh, over what we need, yeah. or for example, the food waste, like it's, it's really a crazy amount of uh, energy what we use and we really uh, don't even need it. So, uh, and many people try to use it as an argument uh, against renewable energy that we it's not possible to produce enough energy uh, to cover all uh, what we need right now with renewables. And yeah, this is true. But we also just don't need that much energy mm. to have uh, the same quality life. We are wasting a lot of energy. It's always yeah. about the consumption side. Sure. Consumption is rising, 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 rising. Okay, we need more and more and more and more re renewable energy. Yeah. Why don't we just for a second think about it? As I have to mention again, the building sector, we are wasting huge amounts of immense amount of energy with heating, with cooling, because they are not efficient. I think I think we even uh, had a podcast recently with uh, with Nicola. We we focused specifically on concrete, and it was su like su surprising that uh, I don't know what was the number, Nicola, ab about the concrete industry that it creates like a 15, 20 percent of the greenhouse gases. It was something crazy like that. Yeah. Just Concrete, yep. you know, just the way we build things. You know, so it's. I, I think it's a good point that when we speak about technological solutions, we don't always have to imagine uh, something very futuristic, something yeah. that doesn't exist. It's just think, you know, changing the way we think about things. Yeah, you know? and uh, like just 
uh, when you hear somewhere that okay, for example, uh, same amount of uh, renewable energy would be would be more expensive, uh, that might be true. But also when uh, we have these structural changes, you simply uh, won't need that much energy. So if you mm. multiply it with the price, it's gonna be still less in the end. Yeah, yeah. But you have to pay for it. Uh, do you think that democracy is the problem? I guess what I'm saying here is that uh, obviously we need a huge societal change you know, of like a legal framework. It, you know, trying to convince people to do something collectively and change their lives mm-hmm. is a long shot. You know, we, we're idiots. You know, let's let's face it. It's, it's going to be you guys you know, are not very slow. Everybody yeah. else, but you guys are not. Every, every, everyone is an idiot about something. You know, <laughs> so, uh, so we we are very slow to change, especially collectively. So I guess my point is that we uh, we are all kind of uh, infantile to certain things. Like we all want to be in cuffs, like metaphorical cuffs. We don't want to make decisions. This is why we expect someone else to make the decisions for us. Meaning that when it comes to things like that, isn't it easier to live in a secular, fairly scientific China, which is also autocratic and can make a snap decision like that? We just do this thing. Or, you know, is it is it better to actually live in a thriving, messy, crazy, dirty democracy? Let's point to the U.S. because of its general impact. So, I guess the way that I want to frame this question is, do we need also a, a different ideological framework in order to be able to address that? Do we need to move towards some sort of, like, heavily paternalistic, behavior on behalf of the governments in order to fix that because convincing us is not going to work i disagree and uh, i think that we are not qualified to answer this question mm. but we have an opinion okay and my opinion is that uh, uh, is that there is no one solution i mean you have to take into account that these countries uh, may it be democratic or autocratic yeah. or dictatorship they have their own traditions and the, the current uh, political system they are maneuvering, and that is what we have to work with. What you mentioned in China is a great example. So maybe if you can uh, convert or convince uh, the Chinese elite, the party elite, that, sure. th- that this is like good business or some some ethical reason, and they they say yes, you can say that's a win-win. But uh, I don't think that any Western democracy would uh, need to be thrown away uh, just because there's a global functioning model. I think that um, one solution could be that, uh, and I know it's going to sound a bit strange and maybe many of you will disagree with me, uh, but maybe there is, we we just need more democracy in these democracies we are living in, or hybrid regimes, uh, and... uh, Uh, The thing is that most of the decisions are made by the federal government or just the centralized government. And for example, if a city or a region or a a county experiences or a village experiences some extreme weather events and they realize, oh, this is about us, not just uh, polar bears, they can get engaged very quickly. Mm -hmm. But still the decisions are made in the capital with the government. So if we could regionalize this or bring it down to city level, and there has been some efforts on this, mm. maybe there would be much more accelerated action in the Western world. And if there's much more accelerated action in the Western world, it can use its global uh, economic wealth to convince everybody else. I think that makes a lot of sense because the, the, the recently there was an example with Athens, I think, uh, uh, which is like the first European city that has a deputy mayor on climate whose sole responsibility is... Uh, uh, to actually figure out how to change the city in a way to make it like less heat resist, uh, like more heat resistant. Uh, so acting on a local level actually makes lots of sense. You know, not to impose it on a billion people, but but from the grassroots. Yeah. And yeah. it's much more easier to convince people because sure. if you go there, they have they feel the they feel the the effects on their daily lives. So yeah. they perfectly know it's not about uh, polar bears or pandas. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and even related to solutions, it's uh, uh, beside like convincing people, it's uh, because it's such a complex problem and because all the effects are, are different in, in the regions, it's actually not possible to solve these problems without the locals and be, without the local knowledge. Yeah. Uh, because those people really know uh, what are 
the, the biggest problems and what might could be the solution. And it's really important to collect this knowledge and put it together. And I think it's impossible to do it from, from really just from the top of the country and then on regional level. Uh, we also mentioned it in the radio that it's important to have these uh, climate adaptation and mitigation strategies uh, in, in separate regions as well to really focus on the problem because uh, in the morning we mentioned, um, or in the afternoon, sorry, we mentioned in the radio uh, many, many times uh, the heat stress. And, uh, and then uh, from our interpreter, we learned that, for example, in Sofia, what's a much more crucial problem, at least from what people really uh, sense already, is like uh, air pollution. Sure, yeah. So then it's a different point of view. And, and you see, um, even though uh, we are um, experts in this field, we didn't know uh, necessarily what's the problem, what you are really facing, at what you are experiencing, and what bothers you the most, and what you have to get rid of uh, the fastest way to have, have a livable city. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think it's, it's a very good point that uh, if you put some uh, uh, scientific dictatorship, we know what is good for you. Yeah. That's yeah. Not, 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 not always true, or most of the time it's not true. Sure, sure. So, and uh, if you want to engage with people, you have to talk to them and ex first talk to them, learn what, what bothers them. Yeah. And then if you can explain to them, and yeah, that's true, but we also have these kind of risks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's important to understand issues locally. I like that point, because especially when it comes to pollution in uh, in Sofia, this is very evident, because the problem comes from like a few neighborhoods, which are, uh, I mean, oddly, the richest and the poorest. You know, one of them are using, you know, wood because it's, you know, cozy, and the other ones because they don't have a choice. Yes. And usually the solution is like, yeah, let's get rid of these people. And, and, and it's like... Uh, you know, it, it's not fixing poverty, which is the obvious cause of this problem. You know, it's like people with horses who are collecting like garbage. You can still see them around Sofia. You know, it's not very aesthetical. And politicians are usually saying, yeah, we will remove, you know, these people from the streets. No. Yeah, you know, try and not you know fix yes. the poverty issue. You know, it's the yeah. don't don't fix my aesthetic problem. I, I just want yeah. to say that this is this is absolutely a regional problem. We were uh, participating in a citizens' assembly on climate change, which was focusing on air quality yeah. in the <laughs> municipality of Miskolc, which is like a, a, a bigger city in north northeastern Hungary, and they have a serious uh, uh, air quality issue. We have um, graph about. Mm -hmm. Do we need that? Yeah, can you bring up, please, the, the air quality uh, air pollution map? Air pollution map. air pollution map of what? Europe. Of Europe, okay. Yes. Yeah, but you have a system. Yeah, just keep. So about Mishkos, that... Uh, uh, okay. There is a... Yeah, it's our red dot, actually. It's literally everything east of Berlin. <laughs> uh, we still live and, in history. And, uh, and yeah. the thing is that uh, there are also many uh, uh, poor neighborhoods in Mishkots, and they are also uh, burning bad quality wood or even yeah. waste just to not freeze during mm. winter time. Mm. Mm. And all the citizen assembly was about how you can raise awareness to people in the middle because, yeah, we should just throw them out of uh, the city and it's solved. No, you cannot solve poverty with laws i mean it's yep. like i end poverty with this decree no it's it, it hasn't ended i mean you have you need to have complex solutions and again what uh, amanda already stated that uh, if we can solve some parts of the climate crisis we can solve a lot of other sustainable we can uh, contribute to other sustainable development goals of the united nations so to put it frankly we will have a better life not just us, but the other people around. And just to look at this map, please do explain. Uh, yeah, so here, what I just uh, wanted to mention related to this topic, that, of course, there are all these red dots, for example, in Eastern Hungary, that was the municipality, what we visited uh, during this conference, and then in Bulgaria, you can also see that uh, mm. the air quality is pretty <coughs> poor, but uh, beside, um, like, the social effects here, what we also have to keep in mind, that uh, climate is also affected by the geography of the regions, uh, of the region. So, for example, here, uh, uh, you have the same issue uh, what we usually also have in Hungary over winters. That uh, yeah, it's basically, yeah. yeah, you are uh, in this in this basin, let's say, uh, surrounded by 
gorgeous mountains. It's so cool, by the way. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, like the bad air really gets stuck in, and you really can't do anything about yeah. that. So it's really important, for example, to in this region focus on this problem uh, more than in other regions where uh, the wind situation is different and it can be cleared. Yeah. Uh, we talked a lot about public communication. Uh, you already mentioned that uh, actually, like climate skepticism is not such a such a big issue anymore. Denialism is not Denialism, an issue, but yeah. skepticism, skepticism is. Skepticism is, yeah. Uh, do you think, and this is very fascist, but do do you think that <laughs> like regulating? We already have Putin on yeah, the stage. So. Yeah, we always it, it always comes up. Um, <laughs> It's okay. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that during COVID, for example, we saw the obvious necessity of regulating speech to a certain degree. You know, we start putting like disclaimers, um, like literally deleting misinformation, you know, like social platforms made this decision uh, collectively. Uh, do you think that when it comes to that, there should be some sort of a regulation in the same in the same way? Of course, I'm not going to give a straight answer to that, but uh, we had an article about uh, the similarities and the similarities of COVID-19 on how tr how the governments acted and acted quickly, maybe in mm. a bad way, but at least they decided to do something because there was an imminent threat mm -hmm. to do something. And uh, that's because uh, the, the, the pandemic, even though it was serious, many people have died and uh, it was kind of a simple problem compared to a wicked problem and this is like um, the terminology for, uh, used in social sciences uh, that is addressed for climate change. I mean a, a politician can go out and make some easy decision, not easy but quick decisions on COVID and change it the next day. Sure. Like we are going to restrict movement, now it's lifted, now it's restricted again. You have to wear a mask, you don't have to wear it, you wear it again. So mm. it, it's easily changeable but uh, to, to address um, the climate crisis I think it needs a much more structural uh, approach uh, from the decision makers, and uh, it's uh, I'm uh, I'm not uh, uh, um, lifting the responsibility, but it's uh, it's a much more wicked problem, and that is why they responded uh, to COVID-19 with quick decisions. Mm -hmm. And in climate change, it should be. Like more sneaky, we should like sneak in no, messages course, into the of education course, of system. Course, <laughs> of course, it would it, yeah. it should have been addressed long ago. Yeah, but I, I you can see because if you have an imminent threat that you might catch a virus we don't know nothing about back in 2020, yeah. and you might die, it's like it's it's like an imminent threat. And of course, yeah. we can explain we, what we tried that climate change mm -hmm. is also an imminent threat, not in the future but right now as well. Yeah, to many of us uh, in this globe. Um, um, yeah, I guess uh, because an example came to my mind, I, I recently visited France. I went with a huge jet, uh, like like did multiple trips. Uh, but uh, what I noticed in France is that there is, you know, a constant public campaigning about healthy lifestyle. It's like literally, did you eat your apple today? You know, it's like you see on bell on billboards, did you eat your veggies? You know, like did you run today? How many calories did you burn? You know, it comes from all. All, it all, matters all. a lot. Yeah, so th this is what I mean by by being sneaky, you know, mm -hmm. by 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 doing like, you know, not very into your face changes like they did in COVID, you know, like, but 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 changing slowly, slowly trying to change the culture of a society Absolutely. by affecting media Absolutely. and education. Yeah. Absolutely, I just think I'm not uh, entirely. Uh, clear with the um, political narrative and uh, mm. um, the party situation or anything regarded to Bulgaria, but I assume that uh, all the advertisement somewhat related to politics, mm -hmm. are, they don't consider climate change or the environmental crisis like a real problem. So you don't see awareness raising posters, yeah, advertisement yeah, yeah, yeah. on TV, how sh should you change or take this seriously? Sure, yeah. And there's a huge potential that uh, governments should uh, focus on this, uh, mm. how to make a society sensitive to this topic. And it should be important because then you don't have to face the wrath of uh, uh, people electing you. Yeah. If you take your time and try to educate them, yeah. you cannot skip this. And, not and right now only NGOs doing this. Yeah. 
And I've having only meteorologists like on TV being like uh, sexy mannequins with like uh, with like short skirts, but actually explaining things to people, right? You know, that's that's that also can be a positive change. Will it be a positive change though? <laughs> it's a bit sexist, but okay. <laughs> Would it be? All right. So, um, do you have anything to add about that? I'm sorry. Uh, you, you yeah, wanted I just wanted something? to say that, uh, for example, air pollution is a very good example uh, for that. Like. Why is it hard to to make it sexy to mm -hmm. act? Because like in COVID, you know, if you didn't wear a mask, we could really see uh, among uh, the people who we saw that they got to hospitalize, like and all these rapid effects. And related to air pollution, thousands of people die because of that uh, in Europe. Uh, even though there are like a very good health system in comparison with the other parts of the world. And still, we don't really care about that because when someone tells you that, okay, you might die a few years earlier in the future because of the air pollution right now, you really don't care about that. In the end, you will care about that three, yeah. four, five, yeah. ten years. And, and, and also, it's really hard to to quantify the effect of, of climate change or, or, or air pollution on your life. But when you when you hear statistics that, for example, in Budapest, the air quality is, is the same like you were smoking three cigarettes per day. And if you tell it to someone who doesn't smoke, smoke it's like, oh, but I don't want to smoke. And just walking mm. on the street, it's a big effect, but still it's something what slowly... Yeah. not good to your health and not good yeah, to yeah, the yeah. environment and we we talked about it a lot but even for politicians you know to advertise something that if you have a huge uh, effort into one direction and changing like all these structural changes these terrible things won't happen with you in the future like that yeah. how can you win an election please elect me so we can avert the catastrophe that hasn't happened yet Old yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you cannot win elections like this, <coughs> which is bad because you should. Speaking about the <laughs> political, the, about a political process, by the way, do you think that climate climate activism, the way that uh, we usually see it on TV, like the um, uh, because you're not on the protests. Uh, I'm not on the protests. No, no. I have to pick up my kid from kindergarten. You should take time. your kids. No, no, no. I know. Uh, well, I guess. I guess <laughs> what I'm saying is, that I, I'm trying to address the more. Uh, let's say. Um, the, the more radical wing of that. Um, how do we make the debate of climate change more more mainstream when what we're actually seeing on TV is like 18-year-old kids uh, deciding that they're not going to go to school and they're blocking the subway system in London, for example. I've, I forgot what was their name, the Doomsday... Extinction Rebellion. The Extinction yeah. Rebellion, yes. They are cool. Do you think that such... Yeah, they are cool. And, and I really enjoy them, you know, to be honest. But don't you think that this is a general strategy is actually radicalizing people in the different direction as well? Just, just it's like interrupting daily life, you know. I don't know how how, how am I trying to I, phrase my uh, question, but yeah. climate activism, uh, like radical climate activism, do you think that it's useful? Yeah, I think just just to give you a few metaphors, just think about uh, there hasn't been any suffragette movement back uh, in mm. the turn of the century in England. Yeah, would, would women have voting rights now? Yeah, if there ha uh, hasn't been a movement by Martin Luther King and all the other black people in the U.S. Would black people would be still in the end of the bus? Yeah. So we have proof and proof and proof uh, in our history that activism and standing up to your right, up to your rights to protest, yeah. actually works. And uh, these people have managed to influence the scientific community. And I, I, I'm actually very sad because. Uh, what Greta Thunberg mostly t uh, says, like 99% in his uh, uh, her uh, speaking time, is she's quoting the IPCC report. Mm. And what is popular? Uh, I don't know. Our house is on fire. How dare you? And the yeah, media, yeah. media only quotes that. And the 99 person, when she's quoting IPCC reports, that's boring. Yeah. So uh, I think that uh, it's not uh, not a good idea to be cynical with this group because they are standing up for us yeah, as yeah. well. And I can only quote uh, Antonio Guterres, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, that uh, said that not the climate activists are the radicals. Those countries are the radicals that are still subsidizing fossil fuels. Right, right. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys, for this discussion.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, just a few closing remarks on my behalf. Uh, I already said we have the green month, so if uh, if this is your gig and you like, you know, talks about si uh, about Earth, uh, yeah, you might enjoy April and everything that we have prepared for you during this month. Uh, you can find it all, all uh, on our calendar. We especially want to thank the people who purchase tickets because this is the best way that you can actually support us. Uh, but um, yeah, this is the next event. But one of the cool ways that you can actually do that is by like a subscription. This is our uh, ratio pass. Uh, so it's um, it's an essentially a ticket for all our events for one year. And today you get a discount if you just go to this code and you can purchase that. Thanks to our Patreon supporters who are giving us donations every month. I can buy a hybrid in 150 years uh, with all these donations, but uh, keep them coming. They're keeping the organization alive. These are the names of these people, so hopefully the list will become bigger. Follow us on any uh, social media, media that you use. I'm glad to see that there are no 16-year-olds here because we don't do TikTok yet. We have no idea how to do that. Uh, but we will try to to learn. We are slowly turning into dinosaurs. Uh, and, of course, our biggest news, it's been a couple of years now due to the pandemic. We didn't get a chance to uh, do our annual uh, Ratio Forum. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is a huge, almost full-day event uh, with uh, three lectures, uh, with one uh, discussion, uh, something that we're really proud of. We're going to try to do two events this year, but... I'm happy to announce that on the 11th of June in Sofia Tech Park, we're going to have our first Ratio Forum for the last, like, since, since the last couple of years. Uh, so, yeah, buy tickets now. It's going to be hundreds of people. It's going to be lots of fun. I can promise you that. Uh, you can see the program as well with very fun scientists. Um, so, yeah. You can do that now. Uh, what else? That's it, I think. I think, yes. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. I hope you didn't get too depressed. There wasn't much science uh, in this conversation, uh, but I think that raising awareness and having a conversation about such an important topic uh, is also important. So thank you once more for coming. Take care of yourselves. And if you can, take care of someone else. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.